I'm Sarah Jackson, and this is Internal Comms Pro, the podcast. We're getting the gears turning as we talk to the experts on our ever-changing world of internal communications. This season, we're shifting the mindset. The work we're doing to coordinate across the company and, you know, taking in all the information from the experts that are external to us was really paying off because people felt every day when they got their daily newsletter that they were actually getting the most up-to-date information. Our strategy has always been to, you know, put it out there multiple places so it's easier for them to find it and they'll get it where they need it. It's no secret that one of our common phrases on the podcast is earning your seat at the table. It's safe to say that when COVID arrived, some of those seats may have been scrambled. In the case of internal communicators, we were suddenly whisked in by our higher ups to help make several important decisions. For many, it's been a great opportunity to claim that seat, but what can you do now to keep it? Our topic for this week is executive communications, and our guest has plenty of experience with getting her foot in the door. Jen Hall is the internal communications director at Novant Health, and her team had an interesting situation to work through. You know, being in the field of healthcare, Novant Health has employees both working from home and on the front lines during the pandemic. The way important news was communicated couldn't be done the same way for both groups. And in this episode, Jen explains how she was able to deliver effective communication to her fellow employees by delivering effective communication to her executives. Let's listen in. Our listeners have really wanted to hear about this topic that we're going to be talking about on executive communication. And I know we're going to get involved um, into the conversation with that and maybe even talk about some current trends. But Let's just start off. Tell us your backstory. How did you get involved in this crazy world of internal communications? It's actually kind of funny because it was a little less than deliberate. I'm actually an English major, and then I did my grad school with um, professional writing. So I started off editing military manuals um, for a government contractor. Um, So it's kind of funny. I just stumbled into this one day because someone in our communications department where I was working went on maternity leave and they asked if I could, you know, fill in and do a couple of things for newsletters and whatnot while she was out. And I quickly fell in love with the different genre and the different type of topic. Um, It was very, very different to go from, you know, editing for military manuals and then suddenly being working on, you know, human interest stories and employee spotlights and other things that were just a little bit easier to relate to, a little less dire um, for sure. So yeah, I, I, gosh, that was 15 years ago now. I and mean, I've kind of just been in communications ever since. Tell me a little bit about the organization you work for, how big, how many employees? Sure. Um, I work for Novant Health, which is in North, primarily in North Carolina. We're dual headquartered in Winston-Salem and in Charlotte. Um, we've got about 35,000 employees, um, mostly in North Carolina, like I said, extending from the middle of the state out to the coast. We've got some partners out there on the coast as well. Um, we've got, gosh, I think about 15 medical centers, and we've got nearly 600, I think, clinics at this point. Um, so we're a large employer in the area, and we're definitely a regional, a large regional <laughs> healthcare center. Okay. All right. Well, given the nature of why I ask is, <laughs> I bet you've got some stories about the great big brave new world we are in with COVID. So I was just maybe talk a little bit about your situation, particularly with um, COVID and how that you know affected uh, your your role, um, you know, in your company. Give us a little backstory of what has been the last, you know, gosh, it's going to be two years if we can even believe it, <laughs> been like for you. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy that right now we're kind of in this sandwich mode. We're peaking again compared to, you know, where we were last March and we had a little bit of a lull there in the middle. But yeah, it's been getting very cyclical on this end. But yeah, for us, I mean, our world was kind of turned upside down overnight um, because we you know, we're very busy all the time doing all of the priority communications to the organization, you know, partnering with nursing or with our medical group or with HR or IT or whoever needs our help getting information out there. Um, but all of a sudden, all anyone needed to know about was COVID-19. And it was our responsibility to make sure that 
everyone on the front lines and all the people like me who are supporting from the background um, have the information we need that day to keep patients safe, to keep ourselves safe. I'm sure you all remember at that point that things were changing by the hour. Um, so it was it was very difficult to stay up to date with things because by the time you got something approved and ready to share, it would have changed already. We learned very quickly to be flexible and nimble. Um, we were able to partner with people higher up in the organization than we normally might have. Usually we have an assigned partner within different parts of the organization, but it's not always the top ranking decision maker. Um, But we learned very quickly we needed to be at that table with the top level to get the information decisions as they were made because there was no time to trickle it down to whoever we might normally work with. So tell me about that. Was that something that your team noticed or did they notice it? Did that just organically happen or did you say, all right, we got to go straight to the top? Talk talk a little bit about that. Honestly, it was a little bit of both. Um, Our senior vice president of infection prevention has a long relationship with our team. So at one point he was like, I'm just adding you to these meetings. (laughs) So our team got to, you know, partner in directly with them. But other parts of the company where we're used to more of like a you know, trickle it down, cascade approach. We had to quickly, you know, kind of cut out the middle guy and get us there at the top of that as well, because we needed to know what the changes were when they were happening, not when someone got around to telling us about it. It was just very great for us to be on hands. And that really, those relationships that we've built have really served us well over the last nearly two years, like you said, Um, because now that we're kind of, I mean, I guess we're at the downward side of the Delta surge, but things definitely ramped up again. You know, we know what to do now. We know who to talk to. They know they can trust us. Yeah, at one point for our team, we did a survey about where people are getting their information, and they said that they trust our COVID-19 newsletter that we put out every day more than they trusted updates from the CDC. So to us, that was a big, you know, like aha moment, like that the work we're doing to coordinate across the company and, you know, taking in all the information from the experts that are external to us was really paying off because people felt every day when they got their daily newsletter that they were actually getting the most up to date information. Could you give us just a maybe a, a high level of how are you communicating with employees? What is the kind of channel strategy? You just mentioned, you know, this this daily newsletter. Is that the kind of the main uh, mode of, of communication. Can you give us maybe a peek into what you're doing on, on to keep them engaged? And I'll have to preface it by saying that things have adjusted to match the needs definitely over the past year and a half. Um, when we kind of hit that peak last March, we shut down every other newsletter that we worked on and everything went into a daily newsletter called COVID-19 Update. Once things got a little bit better, <laughs> I guess over the summer, we were able to cancel that newsletter and just include some COVID topics in our existing team member newsletter or our leader newsletter or medical group newsletters. But sadly, since things got bad with Delta a few weeks ago, we brought back our COVID-19 update newsletter. Um, So that was going out to team members as well, but separate from our normal channels. Um, We know that there's only a certain amount of kind of noise that they can tolerate. And if we put out too much information that's not relevant to patient care during something like a pandemic, it makes us look very tone deaf and it's not very respectful of their time. So while so many topics are very important and they definitely need to get all the information we're putting out there, we feel like it it helps them and it helps us to separate the topics. So if they need the most current COVID-19 you know, data to get their job done that day, they know exactly where to get it. They don't have to go through you know, our great remarkable stories or they don't have to read any reminders about policies that are changing. They can go straight to what they need because we've separated it out for them and they know where to go get it. Well, and I love how you talk about not being tone deaf. And I think that's a a thing sometimes that it's good that you're keeping your ear to the ground on that because we just, we get so focused on our work and and checking these boxes. I love that message to, to our listeners, not only, you know, to not be tone deaf, but also again, to shut it down and just focus on what, what you can, you know, really be good at. So, well, let's talk about this flow of information. So you talked about your seat at that table got accelerated and now you're there. Was there a teaching moment that you had to kind of guide the leadership on how you wanted the information? Like how did you facilitate that conversation and that process so that you could you could execute on quickly getting that information out to the employees. Can we dissect that a little bit for our listeners? Sure. I mean, some of it did happen organically because we needed to get information out there, but there was definitely a time when we were first building out this strategy of how to get information out that we had to tell them, this is what the team members need, and this is what we're going to need from you to get it done. So for them, it meant they committed to a review cycle of if we get it to you by four o'clock on Monday, we need approval by 8 a.m. on Tuesday so we can push it out first thing in the morning. Part of it is knowing exactly who our experts were who needed to sign off on everything. 
which made them kind of get away from the group editing mode or the CC all mode. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've seen that with other organizations, but there kind of seems to be an over evaluation or an extended review process because everyone wants to give everyone a chance to weigh in. And when you're in a pandemic with, you know, daily or more update requirements, you can't really let everyone have a seat at that table. Um, you need to kind of have your designated expert you can review and approve. And you need the other stakeholders who would normally be in the process to understand what is happening and why they're being bypassed. Did you have to provide any other training, you know, to keep everything relevant with the ever-changing dynamic of hybrid work? Like, tell me a little bit about, like, did you have people in, in your industry working from home? I mean, I know with the, the the medical staff, they're there, but there's certainly, there's got to be other positions in, you know, your organization where, where people working from home. Where were all your employees? It did take a little bit of education to get team members who weren't typically at home comfortable with the remote process of how to, you know, log into your remote network, how to do things from home. If you needed a new monitor, if you didn't have a right desk chair, there's a lot of logistics with that. Um, In addition to leaders who wouldn't typically approve of that work style, getting them on board with the idea and the necessity. Um, So there's a lot of training and education around leading remote groups and um, also how to stay engaged with the remote groups. Because it's a little bit harder, especially if you've got some introverts on your team to stay connected. But I'll say the hardest thing we've had to do with the remote work is just reminding leaders who are remote that perhaps their primary audience is not. It's kind of a balancing act of getting information out there, but not it feels sometimes unfair to talk so much about how remote people are and what's being done to accommodate the remote workers when we've got, you know, frontline staff who are more burned out than they've ever been before. So for example, with our executive team, when they talk about things that are being done, you know, across the board, we try to remind them, you know, in your role, you've, you've been home for a year and a half, but the people who need to hear your message right now, they have not. Um, so that's kind of the Again, not try not to be tone deaf to the organization. It's very important to support the remote half of the team. Um, but everything that we're doing is in service of the frontline staff so that they can take care of our patients and our communities. Our talk with Jen will continue after a message from our friends at Circle. We all know there's a large shift happening where employees are trading their cubicles for their kitchen tables. There's a big question that we're all trying to solve. How can we keep our remote workforce truly engaged and informed? Our sponsor Circle has developed the Broadcast Suite to help internal communicators send the right message at the right time. Through intelligent cross-channel, Broadcast curates a connected experience for each employee across all their most valuable channels, email, SharePoint teams. There's even an option to launch an employee mobile app. Head on over to circle.com slash ICP. That's C-E-R-K-L dot com backslash ICP to learn how the broadcast suite engages deskless workers worldwide. Welcome back. In this next part, Jen breaks down how she went about helping leadership keep consistent communication, and the processes she helps set in place. Let's dive back in. Tell me, how do you have those conversations? Like, how do you train them? Because I'm, I'm hearing that, you know, train them on engaging their remote staff, but we also have to continually remind them. So I'm hearing a lot is going on to continually remind leadership about this. Is this a formal process? Is this informal, a combination? Like how do you actually train them on it so that they can be successful and not tone deaf? Yeah. I mean, I would say it's a combination of things. When we talk about just, you know, per- giving people the tools they need to lead remote teams, we typically just do that through our leader newsletter that we send out once a week. You know, we'll include engagement guides or, you know, fun ideas to, you know, have an icebreaker at the beginning of a meeting. Um, that type of stuff isn't so difficult. But with our higher ups, we're always involved in messaging that goes out, um, whether it's the blog our CEO does every week, or if it's just a a memo that's going out as needed from one of our executive team members. We always read it with that lens of, you know, who's going to read this and how will it land on all the different audiences. So that's a very one-on-one thing that we'll tell them, you know, for this point, you may need to adjust this, or you may want to, you know, go a little lighter on this. We're just going to be very sensitive to burnout across the board too. 
we're doing a lot of work in the resiliency area to try to work to work on that, especially with our providers. So I, you mentioned you have a leadership newsletter and, and okay. Tell me about that. What, so that just goes out to leadership. And then that's a, that's a, I think that's a great point for our listeners. If they're trying to get these messages out to remind leadership. So I, I'm hearing you've got one-on-one meetings. You, you have like almost coaching sessions for them when they write their information. You've got a leadership newsletter. What else do you got in your arsenal there to, to help train leadership? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the leader newsletter goes out to anyone who's a manager above every Monday. Um, for us, it's kind of a mix of action items of things they must do. And then, of course, the required need to know things. Um, for that, for us, that's a lot more matter of fact. Get straight to the point. You know, don't add in many adjectives or context or background. <laughs> um, more of this is what you need to know um, for your team this week. And this is what you need to know for your actual action items. Um, it kind of serves as a preview of what we expect the rest of the team members to hear about later that week. So they've got a few days to ask questions before they get asked questions (laughs) as well. Um, So that's one thing that we do. Um, There's a lot being done at the vice president and above level. They have retreats um, that are always very focused with an agenda on, you know, strategy for the organization, um, HR leadership updates, that type of work. I would never go to an architect and say, hey, let me look at that blueprint for you. But sometimes, you know, people <laughs> will always think that everybody kind of knows how to do internal comms. And there's there's a bit of, um, you know, they're being coy about it. But did you have to gain respect and trust? Because I'm like I said, what I'm hearing you say is like, no, we're the experts and they see us as such. But was there a, how did you get there to, to get that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, several ways to answer that one, but. I mean, in a nutshell, we've just been able to forge partnerships with the key stakeholders across the company. Um, So our leader of our medical group meets with our team member who's assigned to medical group communications frequently, and they outline the strategy and they, you know, they get on board before we do anything. So we're in constant contact with any of these leaders who need to get information out. And once you have the top level saying this is how we do things, um, you know, typically everyone else is comfortable with whatever you're proposing. And um, of course, we have a whole different relationship with our medical staff, um, which would be another whole thing, but it just depends who they are. And we know that we can't reach everyone with the same method. And our goal has always been, or our strategy has always been to, you know, put it out there multiple places so it's easier for them to find it and they'll get it where they need it. But yeah, it all comes back to just the strategic partnerships. You know, if you work closely with the people who have decision rights and they can explain to you where they think a need is and you can help brainstorm and develop the solutions, once you have that buy-in and that partnership, it's 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 a good deal. <laughs> yeah, that it sounds like an amazing place uh, to work and to operate. You know, Jen, when you look back over <laughs> this journey with COVID, is there anything that you can share? I know I always ask for what was one really great idea that that you loved, and then I, I like to ask for maybe a not so successful one because that's where we that's where we learn. I don't know if you can share, but it, you know, as you kind of reflect, what what's been your biggest learning of the best ideas and worst ideas? idea. This may sound odd, but working in some gamification has actually been a great idea and a great success. Yeah. And it sounds kind of counterintuitive to everything I also said about being tone deaf and, you know, making sure that they don't have anything more to do. Um, But early on in the vaccine journey, when we were trying to help dispel some myths that were out there, we just put together a 10 question quiz that people could go through and earn badges for, you know, how well they do. It's been one of the most successful things we've done engagement wise in a couple of years, which is great to see. So just that quick, you know, go test your knowledge BuzzFeed type quiz that's proved to be a very quick um, and apparently very satisfying (laughs) experience for our team members compared to, you know, just reading paragraphs and paragraphs of content or an FAQ. Um, So that was a good win for our team that we repeated in other ways as well. Um, you know, just more engagement and you get something out of it at the end, not necessarily just reading text. Yeah. We did an episode on gamification. So I'm glad to hear, to hear, get a practical example of that. I love that. All right. Tell me about something that was a big bomb or an epic fail. You got one of those for me? I'm not sure if I call it an epic fail, but we've had some things not go how we expected. Um, again, back to vaccines, cause that's, you know, been more than half of the COVID journey as well. Um, we were trying to make a very simple, a yes to the vaccine is a yes to, and then, you know, fill in the blank. And we were trying to remind people of daily things that they might be missing that they could get back to. 
Um, so we tried, we had, gosh, over 50 of them because they would change every week, you know, just little reasons that may resonate with different audiences for whatever reason. And 99% of them were great, but there were two that people responded very negatively that surprised us. Um, we were one week telling, reminding people all the things they could actually get for free because, you know, that was a great motivator at their beginning. Um, and we got backlash for mentioning donuts because you could go get a free donut with your vaccine card. Um, they said that was very inappropriate for a healthcare company. So that was a surprise to us because we really thought people would like to know what they could get for free. And we made an example too of how people were excited to wear lipstick again if they could take their masks off. And we were given feedback that that was insensitive to people who are fighting on the front lines to trivialize their efforts down to the level of lipstick, um, which kind of hurt us because that wasn't our point at all. And we never want to trivialize anything. Um, and that idea had actually been submitted to us as something that would resonate with our younger generations. So that was that was hard for us to take when we were trying to do all this great work and we're hearing things are landing on people different ways. So the takeaway from that is we thought we had all our boxes checked and we were ready to go with the whole campaign. And it sounds like we probably should have taken an extra pause to run the exact language through maybe a few more people so that either we could filter out those ideas that may land poorly or at least we'd have something else to back us up to say, but we did do X, Y, and Z. And we're sorry that you didn't love it. But, you know, there is a process in place and we have done everything we can up front. Well, and if people want to know what, I don't know if you can share what you're using or, or if they want to get in touch with you to learn more about that, would you be open to, to talking with them about what you're doing? I'm, I'm sure it's great technology that, that you're using out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. We reviewed actually several vendors over several, <laughs> over many, many, many months. Um, we landed on a tool um, called Circle Broadcast. Um, and we're just now in the beginning of implementation and hoping to have it, you know, up and live with a pilot group before the end of the year. Um, and I'm absolutely happy to answer any questions or clarify anything that I've said. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so um, I'm just there as Jen Hall. <laughs> so you'd be able to find me pretty easily. Well, and, and to circle back on that, when you are implementing that software, how are you socializing that with among the employees? Like, how are you, how are you doing that? Any tips for others who are <laughs> implementing something during a pandemic? Any, any feedback on things you've learned or what you're doing to get everybody excited about delivering kind of this consumer grade experience? Yeah. Again, it starts with the top level for us. I mean, we went to stakeholders who, you know, they may be the final approvers for many of the newsletters that we do. Like I keep coming back to our medical group. Um, they've been very excited or very eager for years to find ways to duplicate content less. So the medical group would have their newsletter. And then we also have our newsletter that goes to all employees. So they may see the same article more than once, which can be, you know, kind of frustrating. Um, so at the top level, we've got buy-in to introduce a new tool, knowing that it may cause a little extra work at the beginning for those who use it um, and for even the recipients if they want to go set up their personalized experience. You know, they'll have to click through and check some boxes to get it to be more personal to them. Um, but yeah, the top level is all in and very excited about it, which gives us the energy. Honestly, it helps us approach it differently, knowing that we've got that buy-in. Um, and then it's just taking it down from there. That's exciting. Well, and to get such a great ROI, I mean, if you can save the employees two minutes worth of not having to look for stuff and to read stuff twice, boy, you're going to always have a seat at that table with those higher ups. I, I can't thank you enough, Jen, today for hopping on and giving us some of your insights and wisdom, particularly among, <laughs> among what you're going through. But it, it's just so important for our listeners. I know they value hearing from folks you know, who are on the ground doing this stuff. I can't thank you enough. Absolutely. It was a pleasure doing this. As Jen discussed, it doesn't hurt to bring in a few extra tools to make the work easier on yourself. Now, don't go away just yet. We have a new segment featuring our good friends from Reagan's Communications Leadership Council on how you can use today's episode learnings right now. Let's tune in. I'm Mandy Zaransky Hurst, Chief Operating Officer at Reagan Communications and Head of Leadership Councils. Today, I have the privilege of talking with Susan Donlin, Chief Communications Officer at KeyBank, 
She's also a member of Reagan's Communications Leadership Council, an exclusive membership for senior level communicators and their teams, offering best practice sharing, networking, and team training, along with a lot of high level communications, peer to peer networking and sharing, which is so important, especially in these times. The last year and a half has been uh, unique, has it not, Susan? Uh, that's one word for it. Uh, definitely. Yeah. It, it rings true. <laughs> yes. And, and manager communications, which is what we're going to talk about today, have been so important for so many reasons uh, in the last year and a half, especially. Susan, I'd love for us to start by you telling us a bit about your role as chief communications officer at KeyBank and then your philosophy on manager comms. Sure. So so I I lead communications at Key. Manager communications, definitely an important part of our internal employee communications approach. Uh, And you're right to call out the the last year. I mean, I think it really brought to light to us just how much we rely on our managers to get messages out and to keep our population informed. We have about 3,000 managers at Key. Um, Man- managing their team is an important part of what they do, but we know they have a lot of other things on their plates as well. So our philosophy is to make it as easy as we can um, and predictable. So we put out a, a manager communication where we bundle together a lot of information, all the information they'll need to help lead their teams every Monday morning. Um, you know, they can reliably know what's coming to them. It's got what they need. Um, we make the content very snackable. We didn't coin that phrase, but we love it. Um, you know, we really want to give people the ability to glance through and then you know, click to go deeper. Um, and if we do share additional information, they can click and go to our internet to get more details. But we really try to make it you know, packaged, visual, easy to consume, and importantly, easy to share with their teams. There's been so much pressure on the managers and senior leaders to get many, many important messages out. While, you know, I've mentioned challenges, there have also been opportunities to strengthen culture by a good manager communication. What are your thoughts there? Do you have examples of how good manager communication has really helped to strengthen the culture of key during such a trying time? Yeah, I mean, that was our experience. It, it was challenging. You know, definitely don't want to minimize that. Um, you know, I think all of us had crisis plans. You know, most of us had a page on pandemics in them, but none of us could imagine just, you know, how quickly the landscape changed, how much we would be reacting to, you know, changing dynamics, implementing policies and making changes, sending people home, um, changing workplaces. You know, we were doing that on the fly and, and none of us really had a playbook for that. And managers were dealing, you know, not just with what their teams needed, but they were living through it themselves. Um, so again, you know, we really focused on how to make it easy for them, you know, trying to make sure we gave uh, managers a preview, you know, heads up, speaking points that they could use to answer questions, we really tried to package it up for them. But what we found is that, you know, by paying so much attention to the details and the little things, you know, answering the questions that they had, um, but then also empowering them to help their teams, you know, we at Key, you know, really led or focused through the pandemic by taking a people first approach. And I I think most companies did that, but, you know, by bringing that to life and really empowering managers to help their teams through this, to have flexibility, we empowered them to also help clients. Let's pivot from manager comms to leader comms. And there's a lot of overlap there, but as a leader yourself being, you know, Key's chief communications officer, how have you helped the other C-suiters who aren't communications professionals better connect at all levels of the company? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we've we all worked with leaders who are just natural communicators and get it and are just great at doing it in what appears to be almost an effortless manner. You know, but, but many leaders were never kind of taught that and it doesn't come as natural to them. Um, so I always, you know, try to think about my job when it comes to leadership communications, you know, my job and my team's job is to try to help our leaders be the best leaders that they can be, but not for their own sake, you know, for all of our sakes, you know, for, you know, if I look at, at our CEO who has 17,000 people who are kind of looking to him for, you know, vision and inspiration and guidance, you know, that's a, that's a lot on his shoulders, but you know, we will all benefit by him being the best leader he can be. 
Now, fortunately, I'm blessed that he is someone who just instinctively gets how important communications are. And he's willing to try things, um, which I think is, is really important because not everything you try is going to work. Um, but, you know, for example, we leveraged video a lot more than we would usually do because uh, I usually am kind of more of a, a less is more and more sparing on video. Um, but during the pandemic, we used it a lot because we would typically have our leaders out in the markets, you know, seeing teammates and clients, and we weren't able to do that. So we did a lot more video and we tried to keep the video really light, you know, and, and to allow people to kind of see different sides of leaders. You know, initially with our CEO, we were doing one a week. Um, you know, and they, these were not fancy videos because we were doing them over, you know, Zoom recordings because we were all virtual. Um, but at one point during one of them, he mentioned a book he was reading. And then in our comment section, when we posted it, everyone started sharing book recommendations. So then we kind of ran with that. And at the end of every video, he would give a couple book recommendations and ask for more. And then we would share in the roundup kind of the top five books that had been recommended. So it's just, you know, the small organic thing that kind of took off and that people really loved and, and gave some gave us something to kind of talk and share about um, that felt a bit lighter. And it allowed people to see a little bit more about him. It, it's so important to feel those connections with leaders that are even a touch personal. So for those that might be younger internal communicators uh, or newer to an organization, what's your recommendation on a way that they could kind of get in their foot in the door to speak with um, C-level or higher up? leaders? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a good question. Um, and again, I think, you know, most leaders instinctively get that internal communications is important. They just don't always necessarily know how to think about it or go about it. Um, you know, so, so the counsel we can provide is really important, but you're right, you need to get in the door to give it. You know, when I talk to my team, you know, I always emphasize how important it is to speak, you know, speak the language of your leader. Um, you know, we work at a bank, um, you know, so, so, a lot of the times the, the, the language are numbers and metrics. And, you know, so first of all, just really understand their business, you know, what they're trying to accomplish, what are their challenges, what are their hurdles, and then figuring out how you can help because there are definitely ways communications can help on that. And then, you know, we really emphasize metrics. I'm not going to claim to you that I have the silver bullet on how to measure effective internal communications, but we're always trying you know, everything we do, we think about how can we measure this success? How can we tie together what we've done with an outcome that is you know, desired by the business? How can we paint that picture to them? You know, the, the leaders we support, you know, they've got metrics for everything down to the paper clips in the branches. You know, we, we better be able to come up with some metrics that help them pull together, you know, the investment they're making in what we do because it is an investment. You know, if we go to a leader and ask for their time on a communications activity, you know, that's an investment on their part. So we need to help make them understand how it's going to get tied to an outcome. So that's a little bit how we think about it and how I really coach my team to talk to their leaders, learn their language. So they'll learn theirs. Yeah, that, that quote of the day is really speak the language of the leader. And that's so powerful because then they begin to really trust and respect you. Absolutely. You can feel the difference when you're talking to a leader if, if they get that you get their business. You know, if, they, if they understand how they make money, how they deliver for their clients, what their challenges are, you can see them kind of open up to your ideas when they realize you really understand their business and their challenges. Susan Donlin, thank you so much for being with us today. A huge thank you to our sponsor, Reagan, Mandy Zarinsky hurst and our featured guests for being a part of our new segment. If you're interested in more information about Reagan's Communications Leadership Council, an exclusive membership for senior level communicators and their entire communications teams, please go to commscouncil at reagan.com. Internal Comms Pro, the podcast, is also proudly supported by the Circle Broadcast Suite, an entire suite built for internal communicators. Learn more at circle.com. Internal Comms Pro, the podcast, is produced by the Internal Comms Pro Collective. Don't forget to visit www.internalcomspro.com slash show notes for our free resource guides. Thank you for listening.